Proverbs chapter 13 verse 20, the Bible says, He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Father, we thank you because there is power in your word. We thank you because heaven and earth will pass away, but not the judge of your word will go unfulfilled. Lord, we have gathered together tonight because we are ready to receive a word from you that is able to save our soul. Lord, the book is open. Open our eyes to see. Open our ears to hear. Open our hearts to gain understanding. I pray for every man, every woman, every boy and every girl. Under the sound of my voice, I pray, Lord, for an impartation of wisdom in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, because no one is permitted to live here the same. Because Jesus is in the house. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Can I hear a big amen? amen. Hallelujah. Um, when you look around, uh, I know that many of you are familiar with some of the analogies I'm going to make. Um, you've probably been to a place and you saw at the gate, beware of dogs. You see a signboard at the gate that says beware of dogs. When you go to a place and you see the signboard that says beware of dogs, uh, uh, that tells you that the territory that you're about to enter into has dogs. And if you have fear of dogs, you have to be careful because this house has dogs on the inside. So they put a sign there that says beware of dogs. Uh, in the same vein, when you go to some places, uh, um, you probably see a sign that says military zone, keep off. You've seen that before. Now, that also tells you that this area or atmosphere or zone or territory that you are about to enter into is a military zone. And the people that are there are not like you. So, as you're about to enter into this zone, you need to be careful before you go in. Also, you probably see the sign also that says, uh, highly inflammable. Now, when you see the sign, highly inflammable, that quickly tells you that this territory you are entering into as materials that are highly inflammable so you have to be careful about what you introduce into that area because if you have anything that has to do with fire it can cause there to be an explosion now all these are warning signs all these are signals that shows you that you are about to enter into an area that requires caution from your own life However, when you look all around you today, you will see a lot of men and women sitting by your side or sitting behind you or sitting in front of you. And when you look around, nobody is carrying any sign on their face. There is no sign on anybody's face. So if I was to ask you now, if the person sitting next to you is HIV positive, there is no way you can know. Why? Because there is no sign that says this person is HIV positive or not. He will also ask you, oh, is the person sitting next to you a virgin or is the person sitting next to you a prostitute? There is no way you can answer that question because there is no sign on their head or on their forehead that reveals that character or dimension of their life. Now, that means that in order for you to truly know people, there are some dimensions of wisdom and dimensions of God that you need to have that will help you. And that is why tonight I want to share with you on avoiding relational danger zones. I want to try to reveal to you by the wisdom of God that just as we have these different territories that requires caution in your access, you also need to realize that there are individuals on earth today that are danger zones. Just as places can be danger zones, individuals also can be danger zones. However, if you don't realize that they are danger zones, you will willingly walk into their life and become a casualty of their venom. And I'm trusting God that in the next few minutes as we share, your eyes will be open your understanding will be open wisdom will come so that if there are individuals around you that have constituted a danger to your destiny that there will be a divine separation in the name of jesus now there are two things i want to lay as a foundation as we begin to look into these individuals that are danger zone the first thing i want you to realize is that marriage is not your destiny marriage is not your destiny i've come to realize over the years that a lot of people because of their desire to marry they have come to a place where they have become so desperate and out of desperation they have waved away a lot of warning signals and they have become casualties of love marriage is not your destiny when you look at the bible in the book of genesis chapter 1 when god created man in genesis chapter 1 verse 26 and 27 and 28 and 29 the godhead came together and they said let us make man in our own 
own image and let them have dominion. He didn't say let us make man so that they can go and marry. He said let us make man so that they can have dominion. So marriage is not your destiny. You are not created because of marriage. Marriage was created because of you. However, when you have this desperado mindset about marriage, you will find yourself not thinking through about what you get yourself involved in. So marriage is not your destiny. Listen to me, people of God. You will not go to heaven because you are married or because you are not married. When you get to heaven, they don't welcome people as couples. There is no Mr. and Mrs. in heaven you get into heaven as a man or as a woman that has a covenant relationship with God through the blood of Jesus Christ however there one thing you also need to understand is that even though you don't need marriage to enter heaven marriage can hinder you from entering heaven if you get involved with the wrong person praise the name of Jesus so the first thing we need to lay as a foundation is marriage is not your destiny there is no need to be desperate about marriage the God that created you has created all things to be beautiful in his appointed time and one thing I've come to realize is that God will always make you to enter into the realm he has prepared for you when the time comes so don't be desperate don't allow yourself to come to a level in your life where you feel that you are inferior to somebody else because they are married I've come to realize in life that new model is always an improvement upon the old model. Every time you see a new model it's because there is something about the whole that, that was not good enough that they needed to upgrade. And that's why I know that you don't need to be desperate about marriage or feel insecure because somebody has gotten married before you. Because everybody that has gotten married before you their marriage has become old model. And when your time comes your marriage will be new model. And because... Oh, because there is no way that old model can be as good as the new model. It means that your home will be better. Your gown will be better. Your cake will be better. Your venue will be better. Your wisdom will be better. Somebody say yes. So don't allow yourself to be desperate about marriage. If you marry the wrong person, listen to me, this has been scientifically proven. Marrying the wrong person can reduce the quality of your life by 63%. I'm telling you. So if you marry the wrong person, it can reduce the quality of your life by 63%. So don't get to that level where you think, oh, I want to marry, I want to marry. No, in its time, it makes all things beautiful. Fruit is meant to be eaten. But when you eat fruit before its appointed time, it will give you stomach upset. Yes, you're going to get married, but when the time comes, it's going to make a way for you. Turn to your number and say, neighbor, it may not be my turn today. But when it's my turn... All things will work together for my good. Hallelujah. So number one, foundation that I want to lay is marriage is not your destiny. Concentrate on what God has called you to do. Concentrate on discovering God, discovering your vision, discovering your purpose. And at the appointed time, God will move you into the realm of marriage. Number two, love is not enough. That's a foundation that you also need to understand. Love is not enough. The mere fact that you love somebody does not mean that they are good enough for you. There are people that love to drink, but drinking is not good. There are people that love to smoke. Smoking is not good. There are people that love sex, but prostitution is not good. So just because you love something does not mean it is good for you. Do you understand that? So you need to understand that love is not enough. There are people you love, yet you can't marry them. And you have to be matured enough to say, I love you, but I love God more. I love you, but I love my destiny more. I love you, but because we are not going in the same direction, I'm saying, I love you, but bye-bye. So, love is not enough. Because a lot of people think that just because you love someone, then that's all you need. No, in the world of relationship, you need more than love for relationship to survive listen to me, in the relational stew of life, uh, love is one of the ingredients, uh, but there are many other ingredients that has to be in place uh, for that love to be in place. Listen to me, you may have all the love in your life, but where there is poverty you will be in trouble, because there is no romance without finance. And when a woman tells you, I love you the way you are, I love you the way you are does not mean I love you to remain the way you are. Every time a woman tells you, I love you the way you are, is a statement of faith. She's hoping that somewhere along the line, your story will change. If your story does not change, she will cut a Timothy arrow for you. He that cannot take care of his house is worse than an infidel. 
So love is not enough. It's not just enough to love someone. You must be sure that every other ingredient is in place before you go ahead into that relationship. Amen. Now, having laid that foundation, let me share with you of 10 people that are danger zones you need to avoid. 10 danger zones. 10 individuals that constitute a danger zone. 10 individuals that if you go into that territory relationally, you might become a victim and a casualty. Number one, an unbeliever an unbeliever. Any man or woman that does not have a relationship with Christ, any man or woman that has not entered into a covenant with God uh, through the shed blood of Jesus on the cross of Calvary is not born again. He may be a church goer, he may be a Bible carrier, but as long as he does not have a relationship with Jesus, uh, he or she uh, is not good enough for you to relate with uh, when it comes to intimate relationship. Why? Because it will be a virus upon your destiny. So an unbeliever is not someone you should relate with when it comes to intimate relationship. Why? That's a danger zone. Listen to me, people of God. I don't care how nice he is, even if his name is nice. I don't care how good he is, even if his name is goodness. I don't care how powerful he is, even if his name is power. It does not mean that you should relate with that man or that woman. Why? Because when an unbeliever is your fiance or your fiance, then the devil is your father-in-law. So you need to make sure that you don't get into that deception of nice teaser or deception of charmingness or riches. You say, oh, you know, the pastor, you don't understand. The guy is very nice. He's so caring. He's so charming. Ah, the difference between charming and amen is letter C. Remove C from charming and the guy will become amen. So you need to understand that you should not get into that dimension of life where you feel that just because something feels good to you, you should pursue it. Eh, can I marry a Muslim? But you see, the guy is a nice, he's even better than some Christian. It's not about who he is, it's about who he's connected to. Praise the name of Jesus. So number one, don't connect to an unbeliever. That's a danger zone. Number two, an angry person is a danger zone. There are people that have anger problem. Listen to the people of God. The mere fact that somebody is born again uh, does not mean that they are completely free. There are many people. Uh, oh, if I, let me take it deeper. Now, when you say someone is born again, what that means is that that man or that woman has a regenerated spirit. That means the spirit of that man or the spirit of that woman has been regenerated. However, a man is a spirit. He has a soul and he lives in a body. So even though that man has a regenerated spirit, he has an unregenerated soul and he has an unregenerated body. So he needs to take the soul through a process called sanctification. Now if that soul does not go through a process called sanctification, even though his spirit is regenerated, he can behave worse than an unbeliever. He has to take the body through a process called subjection. And if he does not subject the body, the body will subject him to the will of the flesh. So that is why you need to understand that when you meet with people that are born again, you must be sure that apart from being born again, they are committed to transformation. They are committed to sanctification. They are committed to making sure that everything about them, spirit, soul, and body, line up with the plan and purpose of God for their life. Listen to me. Anger is one letter short of danger. Add D to anger. What do you get? Danger. So an angry person is a dangerous person for you to relate with. Because when you relate with angry people, they will mess up your life and they will end up bringing you to a place where you become a victim and a casualty of love. A young lady came to our church um, some time ago and she was looking battered and bruised like someone that had a collision with a trailer. And I walked up to her and said, my sister, what's wrong with you? I said, it's not well. What happened to you? Apparently, she was going out with this fake guy and the guy uh, got angry and the guy just beat her up. The guy beat her up that she was hospitalized for two days and she was plastered all over and bandaged all over. And I said, wow, you mean a man did this to you? He said, yeah, yeah. I said, ah, you can't buy that kind of way. He said, no, I'm going to, you know, he has apologized. He has apologized. I said, he did what? He said, no, pastor. I said, well, not in, not, not in this church. We can't marry those kind of way. He said, oh, no, poor pastor, I still love him. I still love him. I said, he apologized. A man has not yet married you and he's beating you like this. If you marry him, you have given him a license to kill. And guess what she told me? He said, hey, you know why he spoke? He said, he didn't know what came over him. You know, he didn't know what. And I said, look, that guy has anger problem. And people that don't know what comes over them that makes them to do what they do, don't marry them until you are sure that that thing that normally comes over them has stopped coming. 
Hello, somebody. So, listen to me. Anyone that has anger problem, be careful. You see a lot of people, they are moving on. Sometimes, when you see the way people pray, sometimes it can be a pointer. There's nothing wrong in dangerous prayer. There's nothing wrong in aggressive prayer. But watch some people. Sometimes you see some people. By the time you marry them. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So number one, an unbeliever. Number two, an angry person. Number three, an insecure person. An insecure person is a very dangerous person to relate with. They are in danger zone. What do I mean by an insecure person? An insecure person is a man or a woman that have problem with themselves. And because they have problem with themselves, everybody that comes to a relationship with them falls under the category of their problem. Insecure people will make your life insecure. An insecure man, an insecure woman will always monitor your life. An insecure man, an insecure woman will always doubt your integrity. An insecure man, an insecure woman will always believe that there is something behind everything you are saying. They read meaning into your words. When people are insecure, you see people that a guy is going out with a lady and every time the lady comes, the guy begins to check her phone. He wants to check the caller ID. He wants to check the inbox to know who sent her an email or who she sent email to. He wants to check her bag. And every time he sees any card or anything, that lady says, who is Tunji? Who is Bola? Who is Shade? And you, they begin to question why? Because they are insecure. Insecurity is terrible. When you hook up with an insecure person, you are enrolling for insecurity in your own life. Because insecure people have problems and they need to be free from their insecurity before people can begin to connect with them. And most of the time, people that are insecure are insecure sometimes because of their past experiences. Just because of what they have gone through in the past, they are still in the prison of their yesterday and then they will bring you into their yesterday's prison. And then you find yourself becoming a prisoner just because you hook up with an insecure person. Don't you say, are you secure? Don't you person and say, are you secure? So people are insecure sometimes because of their past. Sometimes because of their upbringing or their background or, or the things that they have seen happen all around them. And you've got to be careful. When you see insecure people, when they meet with you, they want to separate you from all your friends. All your friends are bad. And they met you among the friends and toasted you or proposed to you among the friends. And now that they have you, they want to make you believe that everybody you have been relating with is the wrong person. If the people you have been relating with are the wrong people, then you too must be wrong. Hello? But what they tell you is, oh, I don't like that guy. I don't like this one. I don't like that one. They keep separating you from everybody that matters in your life. Everybody that helps you to get to where you are just to make you feel that they should be the most important thing. There is nothing wrong with you being the most important thing, but that does not mean that you should be the only thing. Every other person that has helped me has to be around me to help me because if not for them, you will not see me to marry. So when you meet insecure people, your mother is a witch, your father is too strict, your sisters are rude, your brothers are too bad, your friends are not up to your level, your girlfriends or people that you know that are ladies, they are all eyeing you. So they will always look for a way to tell you that everybody around you is bad and it's because of their own insecurity. And it's very terrible, especially when you are a lady and you marry an insecure man, that can be very, very terrible. I remember the case of a young pastor, he was engaged to this lady and he lost this lady just because of his insecurity. When this lady comes into his house or the meet, he will always check her phone, check her caller ID, check inbox, check the bag. Anytime he sees anything that has to do with it, he says, who is this guy? How did you know him? Why did he give you your card? And the guy he says, look, I walk in the island. What's wrong? I meet guys every day. They are my colleagues. So what's wrong in a man giving me guys? You have to be careful. You know you are engaged now. You have to let them know you are engaged. But in what way does engagement hinder me from having friends? And this guy went on and on and on and on and on. And the lady started complaining. I said, well, well, God will lead you because sometimes as a pastor you have to be very careful because when people are in love they don't listen to counseling so you see and when people, when people refuse to learn by experience they learn by revelation and when they refuse to learn by revelation they learn by experience so one of the two will happen so I'm always very careful because when people are in love they will use you to settle their case at the end of the day when they say, say is this what pastor said that's what pastor said say, don't mind that pastor so I don't want to get I say, well, as you are led, the Lord will lead you, the Lord will guide you. All I can do is pray for God to give you clarity of direction. And a few weeks after that, she was supposed to meet with this guy. The guy said, let's have a meeting. And she said, well, I will not be able to make it until the weekend because I have a very busy week in the office. So they planned to meet in the weekend. And guess what? She got to the office the next day and they discovered that one of their colleagues had an accident and was in the hospital. 
coincidentally the hospital was on the streets where the fiance lives so she organized that the office should send her with somebody else so that they will go and visit this colleague so that she can have time to visit her fiance now so the reason for that journey was even because of her love for this guy said let me see his face once again and guess what so they sent her and one guy from the office and now they got into the streets and as they were going they were discussing they were actually discussing about this guy and he was telling the guy, say, please, oh, let's go to the hospital and see this person. I need to see my fiance. His house is not too far. We'll just pass the other person. He said, okay, no problem. So they were discussing about him. Lo and behold, here the guy comes. And the lady out of her side said, ah, this is my fiance coming. And she was walking towards him and the guy just walked past her. And just went on as if she does not exist. The lady was flabbergasted, overwhelmed, confused, depressed. All of a sudden, the guy was like, ah, is this not the man you are making noise? Is this one a pastor? He, I don't know why you allow these church boys to deceive a fine girl like you when people like us are there. And the guy began to browse the websites. <laughs> Hello? Great mistake. Why would the guy do that? Insecurity. Just because he saw her with another guy, he has concluded his mind has gone on riot. He has painted a picture. His imagination has written a script, produced it, casted people for it, come out with it, edited it, and produced. Out of anger, out of disappointment, the young lady could even go back to the office. She went back home, depressed. The mother asked her what was wrong. Before you know it, she told the mother. And by the time parents are involved, you know the case is closed. So by the time the guy will meet with his own friends to say, say, can you imagine? They say, hey, you mean you walked out on her? Are you a man at all? So even if you met her with another man, can't you claim your territory? <laughs> so they told him, you have made a great mistake. You better go and beg her now. By the time he will call the girl, she didn't pick his phone. By the next day, the girl says she's no more interested. That's how the relationship broke. Turn to your number and say, are you secure? The next person you need to be careful of is a control panel. A control panel is a danger zone. What do I mean by a control panel? A control panel is a man or a woman you relate with that will always want to control everything about your life. It is either their way or the highway. If they disagree with you, then you are in trouble. If you disagree with them also, you are in trouble. If they say this is the way, that must be the way. You don't have any opinion. They control what you do. They control everything about your life. So be very careful when you relate to people and you begin to see that sign of control and having a dominating spirit over your life, you've got to be careful. A young lady walked into my office um, years ago and she came to me and said, Pastor, I'd like to see you. I said, yes. And the way she was going, I was afraid. Well, you are my pastor and you are my father in the Lord. And I want to ask you a question and I know you are a man of integrity so I want you to be honest with me and tell me the truth because I really need to know because I, in fact I need somebody that is close to me that is to tell me the truth and I was there just wondering <laughs> come on you might look by me let you <laughs> she, in the last two years I've had about four broken relationships I don't understand what is happening they will just disappear and say they are no more interested but this last one is really pissing me off it's really pissing me off can you imagine do you know what he came to me just yesterday and he was telling me that he just wanted to help me that I may not know why he's breaking up but he wants to help me so that I will work on myself because of the fact that I am too dominant and I'm too controlling that, and he doesn't want that kind of a wife because he wants a peaceful life can you imagine pastor can you imagine excuse me sir I want to ask you am I dominant <laughs> I said, my sister, even me that I'm your pastor now, I'm afraid. <laughs> you are already terrorizing me. I know what she said. Eh, you too, you too. Can you imagine? Are you not supposed to be my pastor? Are you not supposed to tell me that? Are you not supposed to encourage me? So you are saying I'm dominating? Eh? Do you know that's how she left church? She's still not married as of the last time I know, which is almost six years after that discussion. Hello? Are you a control panel? Are you a man or a woman that wants to control people's life? 
Don't do what married people do until you are married. Control panels. They want to control your life, your finances, your time, your movement. You are not yet married. The guy is telling you to resign just because he's threatened by your achievements. He's telling you to resign because he's a teacher earning 25,000. You are working in oil company earning 212,000. He says, you know, that job is not too good for you. You have to resign and start something else. Hello? Be careful of control panel. The young guy got engaged with a lady and while they were still cutting, they started wearing and co. They never marry you. They are wearing uniform. <laughs> Hello? While they are still cutting, he used charismatic razzmatazz for the babe. And they started having a joint account. His salary was 25,000. Her salary was 185,000. And guess what? Apart from having a joint account, they will put the money there. He was the only signatory. He will now tell the girl this week, this is your allowance. That you know you have to submit as the head of the family. Let us pray. So this is your allowance. So he will tell her, okay, this for the charge card. You have to eat, okay, eat 100 naira food. 200 is enough for you. Drink pure water is okay. Start a money. I'm telling you, they are not yet married though. To now crown it up, he now razzmatazz the girl again to collect loan so that they can buy a car. So the girl collected the loan and they got a car and the girl was paid from her salary. And immediately the car came, he started carrying other girls. By the time the relationship was broken, he ran away with the car. The remaining money in the joint account was with him and the girl still paid for the car three years after the relationship was broken. So, be careful of control panel. Relation, any relationship that controls you is not good for you. Hello, somebody. You've got to be careful. So, talk to you and say, are you a control panel? Are you a control panel? You a control panel? Number, number five. A stingy person. A stingy person. Stingy people are danger zones. And you've got to be very careful of stingy people because stingy people always have a way of escaping expenses. When you see a stingy man, anytime you need to spend money, it will, it will take two minutes to look for his pocket. Okay, um, 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 okay, um, while he's still doing that, uh, you will have brought that money. He's a strategy. He's a stingy man. He's a stingy man. When you see a stingy man, when it's your birthday, he will say, he's a kind of birthday. We should only celebrate new births. When it's Christmas, he says, Jesus was not born in December. When it's Valentine, he says, Valentine is not scriptural. They always look for every excuse to escape expenses. A young guy lost a good wife because he was stingy. This babe was a good babe, committed to God, good job, cultured, homely, well-cultured, well-mannered. And when they broke the relationship, I was surprised. And this lady came to me and said, Pastor, this relationship is over. The guy first told me, that, can you imagine, Pastor, get hello, I don't get see you on serious. What happened? So I okay, bring our lady discourse. When we sat down and this lady started talking, even me myself, I knew that she was wise. So, Pastor, it's a great honor to be before you. I'm, it's unfortunate that it's this kind of issue that will make me to be able to sit close to you like this for the first time. Say so it's really unfortunate. I'm really very sorry for having to take you through this. Ah, when she started that angle, ah, he had gone last song. Ah, palliative, near palliative. Say, so, well, the relationship is over, and I was told you wanted to see me. I'm here, but I just want to let you know before we say anything so that we don't waste your time. That there is actually nothing you will say here that will make me change my mind. Is there, and by the time I finish explaining, you will know why. Because I actually broke the relationship because I am obeying your wisdom principles. Hmm. 
So when she has set me up with all those, <coughs> I perished. <laughs> so she said, number one, you have taught us never to wave away warning signals. See, and this guy has shown me enough signal that there is danger in front. See, let me just give you like two or three examples. Say, sir, one day we're going out and we stopped the bus and there were three empty seats in the back and one empty seat in front. And this young man ushered me to the back seat without sitting with me and went to sit in front. He said, sir, I was wondering, I said, is this guy not a man? You're not supposed to sit with me, enter with me. He put me in the back and went to the front. So I kept quiet. When the conductor was asking for money, the conductor said, hey, hold on, why you? And the guy did like this. <laughs> Telling the conductor to come and collect money from me. Say, sir, I paid the money. I didn't see it as a problem. Maybe it doesn't have changed. No problem. When we not came down, he said, sir, do you know what he told me? He told me, where is it in the Bible that the man must be the one to pay? He said, and I told him, never in your life use Bible to manipulate me. I'm not an unbeliever. He said, so from that day, I began to notice that something is wrong somewhere. He said, so he, she began to tell me stories upon stories upon stories. The final one she now told me, he said, sir, my birthday is on the 26th of December. He said, I told this young man, we are in a relationship, what are your plans? Because as a manager in my office, all the staff were planning a birthday for me and they were willing to come to office on the 26th because of me. And I know that nothing, nothing, a minimum of one million will drop by virtue of that special birthday. I know. Because I, I experienced so I felt that, okay, what are your plans? And he told me, oh, no, you don't need to go to that office. It's not important. I have plans for you. I've got plans. I've got plans. So I said, no problem. He said, so, sir, 25th came, nothing, nothing. 26th, I called him. So what's the plan, oh? Today's 26th. He didn't even call me to say happy birthday. I was the one that called him to say how far now. What's the plan? Am I coming to your place? Are you coming to my place? He said, okay, uh, happy birthday, happy birthday. He said, sir. So I forsook what was planned for my office and now went down to his house. Yeah, my boy, my boy, my boy. <laughs> so I went to his house and I sat down there. And this young man went to buy me a bottle of malt. After about one hour of sitting down. And when he came, I said, are we not going now? He said, ah, yeah, the last. We'll tell you, we'll tell you, yeah, we'll tell you. He said, and I told him, I said, come, excuse me. I don't understand. Is it that Christianity means that we should not respect ourselves or appreciate? I don't understand. Today is my birthday. Even if you didn't do Christmas, this is my birthday. And I've shared so, so you mean we are not going now? He said, hey, you know what? I have plans. You know, the money I have now, I'm planning. You know, it's the money I'm planning to use to use to marry you. You know, I'm just putting the money together. You know, so we have to be careful. He said, and I told him, if you are looking for money to marry me, won't you keep me alive till wedding day? Say, so that coupled up with many things, I know that this is not the best man for me. Say, so pastor, if I am your sister, will you advise me to marry him? Who <laughs> set me up big time? So don't be stingy. Don't say, are you stingy? You see, a lot of people think that you need money before you can show that you care. No! No matter how little, when you see people that are generous, is a spirit. Generosity is a spirit. Stinginess is a spirit. You see some people, they may not give you any money, but the way they will be, you say, ah, he, kill a ah, who need 10,000, ah, be the low, ah, ah, he, 200, very low and be, ah, he, she, but 200, you know, ah, how long I say, you know, they will be praying, you know that this person, if they have, they will do. But you see some people, you need 10,000, and say, well, it's well, I just have about 15,000 here, but I have plans, so I may not be able to. You, you see that they are not even concerned. When you are going out with a man or a woman, they don't need to buy you a car to show that they care. But there are little, little things that people do that shows that this person is not stingy, is not a troublesome person. So you have to be very careful about that. Number six or seven or whatever, the next danger zone you need to be careful of is a religious person. 
Listen to me, Christianity is not a religion. No. There are some terrible people in church now, they will use scripture to confuse your life. Religious people, they always have scripture for everything. Can you imagine a man telling a woman that where is it in the Bible that the man should be the one to pay? Is that not a charismatic class matters? Hello? So a religious person. You see, Christianity is not a religion. And when you relate with religious people, you are going to have a very boring marriage. Christian marriages today are one of the boring marriages because a lot of Christians are more religious than Christians. Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship with God. Christianity is a way of life. So when you are a religious person, you discover that religious people don't have fun. Religious people don't enjoy life. Religious people don't play. How will you marry a man that you cannot play with? Everything is too serious. Everything is Pharisee and Sadducee. You marry a man that you can't see. You can't sit down on the rug and roll and play and have fun. Everything in the tikpa 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 tikpa. Welcome, daddy. Husband will be calling my wife, will, mommy. My wife will call husband daddy. What is daddy? Is that a name? When did your husband become your father? And by that they call him daddy. Oh no, I'm a dikiri. Uncle mommy, oh no, mikiri. By that you call your wife mommy, she start growing. Mommy, mommy, mommy. Why not look for a good name? Sweetie, baby, honey, darling, love. Abraham called the wife Sarah and she was growing younger. Hello, somebody. Because when you marry religious people, everything about them is religion. And you met people that you are about to eat with them, and when they say, Let us pray, you know you are in trouble. Let us pray. Father, Shepa Lakataya. Rebu Sebra de Debo Shakaya. Lord, we thank you for this food. Meko Palate Salata Yaka. Lord, as you are about to eat, Yebarado. Dodo, AKK, Ewa, Ia, Saladi, Saladi, AK, Pala, Ero, Ero, Meat, Shaki, Shaki, Rebo Saka. Before they finish prayer, Onga has killed you. So when you meet religious people, life is so boring. They are not spontaneous, they are not exciting. Those are the people that after marriage, they will now come to God. Be, the, the, you see, I've, I've seen things in the last 17, 18 years of pastoring. I've seen things. I've seen Christian couple cry because they are in a boring marriage where there is no sexual intimacy and sexual love. Where the husband will not sleep with the wife until he hears from the spirits. Father, in the name of Jesus, this thing we are about to do have mercy. As we do it, close your eyes, Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Number seven. A pessimist is a danger zone. Who is a pessimist? A pessimist is somebody that is very negative and very critical. That's a pessimist. Very negative and very critical. There are people that all their life, they will see evil before they see good. When they enter into a place, no matter how beautiful the place is, it is what is wrong that they will see first. And you have to be careful because these people have a very pessimistic view of life. Everything is terrible. Ah, Nigeria is bad. This country is useless. When they meet with people, everybody, ah, everybody is bad. So when you are going now with somebody that always sees that everybody is bad, it won't be long before you two will become bad. So be very careful. Because one of the things I find difficult to be able to understand about Christianity is hypocrisy. The level of hypocrisy in the church and among Christians is so terrible that sometimes I begin to wonder, do these people know that Heaven is not a place for rascals. I'm telling you, because see, you see people, Christians, they can talk evil of you now, wash you down. And the next minute when you come, they start smiling. Ah, welcome. How are you? Hey, you are blessed. I 
and the very minute you go again, they start again. You're like, ah, but why is it? Hey, you know, this life is ah, hele. you have to be very careful. These people are very dangerous. So, when you meet with pessimistic people, critical people, people that are always criticizing everything, they do whatever they don't understand. Instead of them to ask questions or to seek to understand, they will criticize. Why? Just because they don't understand. For instance, I give you a perfect example. As a pastor, I don't believe in religion. And because I don't believe in religion, I do a lot of things in the church that ministers to the total man. So sometimes we come to church on Sunday morning, it's just drama, no preaching, no praise worship. We just act drama, people get blessed, we make altar. Sometimes we do a Sunday morning concert. Sometimes we come to church on Sunday morning, it's just question and answer Sunday. I don't preach. Ask question, I answer, we go home. Sometimes we come to church, it's a career service. We bring in a career expert to talk to us about developing a career. Sometimes we come, it's health service. We talk about health and nutrition, HIV and AIDS, sex and sexual. We talk about different things. We do things and people criticize our church. They say they don't quote it. It's not a Bible base. Karama wants it for you. It's just too, they are too shy. fancy, fancy, fancy. So our church is quite about two or three of this size. We have air conditioned, a big place, about 2,000 people. So people on the area say, ah, they don't, these people, they don't want to my Jew at here. So people criticize the church. They are very critical about many things. And they have never taken time out to come and ask questions. I say, why do you people do this? Why do you people do that? But over the years, I've discovered that in the last few years, we have remained consistent doing what we know to do and applying the strategy that God has given to us, many of those people are now coming to say, ah, now we are understand. We didn't understand what you were doing then. We understand. Just this morning, something happened. This, son, this, this week, we have what we call September to remember. So today, we had what we call celebrity time out. We, we invited Alex Osifo Omiagbo, a Nollywood celebrity. Born against Springfield, believer is the men's fellowship coordinator of his church, building committee chairman of his church. His pastor is Pastor Igele, Bishop Igele. He's a powerful Christian. Been born again from the 80s, even before he became popular. People don't know that, but we know. Tell you, babyface, young comedian. Pastor goes to Daystar Christian Center, Reverend Samadhi, my friend. I know he's a Christian, I know he's born again. But because people don't know, when they saw him, they say, Ah, really, I'm to think Ben would born church. I don't know where. So, People began to speak, and one of my members to me said, ah, Pastor, people are criticizing this book. I said, That's none of my business. I'm not doing it for them. I'm doing it for unbelievers. I'm doing it for the believers to learn and be inspired. Guess what? They were criticizing the program. He does not even know our church. Can you imagine? He only saw the ambil. He did not, does not even know the church. And guess what happened? I'm telling you true life story that happened this morning. Yesterday night, Somebody came in from the UK that was his family member. And the guy told him, there is a pastor that came to preach in London. I want to go to his church. And the guy said, take me there. So he came to the church because he was bringing somebody that came from London, not knowing it was the same church he was criticizing. After the service, they said, somebody said he wants to see you. I said, I'm going to a lonely. I'm not seeing anybody. I'm a... So as I was walking, he said, sir, I must see you. So I said, what? He said, I want... he just knelt down. I said, what? He said, I want to apologize. He said, I've spoken about what I don't understand. I said, who are you? I don't know you. He said, you see, he now gave me the story that, in fact, he was so blessed that he was shedding tears when these people were giving their testimony. That he was like, so these people are born again that you just say things you don't know. Now, that's an example. People just criticize what they don't know. So listen to me. When you meet critical people, run away. Because if they talk bad about everybody around you, that's the same way they will talk about you to other people. Do you understand that? Number eight, a moral... I call them loose cannon, a loose cannon, a morally loose person. When you see people that are morally loose, be careful. That's a danger zone. Any man you are in a relationship with that wants to sleep with you or sample you before he marries you is not good enough. Why? Because that man does not have what it takes to be your husband. Listen to me. A lot of people quote scriptures like, if you know you cannot hold yourself, get married. Listen to me, that is Apostle Paul's opinion. That's not Jesus' opinion. Do you understand what I'm saying? Jesus Christ said, if you look at a woman to lust after her in your heart, you have committed the act already. So whether you marry or you don't marry, lust still qualifies you for hellfire. So listen to me, if you have a problem with lust, marriage cannot deliver you from lust. I've seen people that were okay until they married, and after marriage, they started sleeping around. 
So don't think that marriage will deliver you from so as a born again Christian that wants to walk in integrity and walk in the purity and sanctification that God has done of us, you must make sure that you walk upon yourself and you are free from every moral, emotional weakness that can destroy your destiny. And let me give you a revelation. Don't bother to rise if you plan to fall. Don't bother to rise if you plan to fall. If you know you are planning to fall, don't bother to rise. Just stay at the bottom. Because he that is down means fear no fall. I stand before you today. Four years ago, my life hit a major storm. A storm I never believed could become my portion. The storm came. It almost scattered everything about my life. All manner of allegations, all manner of lies, all manner of things. Investigations. People were sent to investigate my life. And guess what? I'm still standing today. You know why? Integrity. Integrity. Listen to me. If I have had any skeleton in my cupboard, you will not hear my name again. I will have become a byword or an history. But in the last four years, I've seen God like never before. I've seen the power of integrity. I've seen the power of his grace. And I've seen his blessing. Why? Integrity. So don't rise if you plan to fall. If you know you have a problem with immorality, work on yourself. It can destroy your destiny. Don't get into it. Virginity once lost can never be regained. Secondary virginity is a motivational therapy. Whatever is lost is lost. Hello? So make sure you don't get into that place where you move with people that are telling you, hey, if you love me, you will sleep with me. No. If you love me, you go wait for me. So if someone is truly in love with you, they will wait. So don't allow yourself to get to that point where you are moving around with loose people. Um, my brother, come. Because see, I see a lot of people. Somebody asked me a question one day. He said, How do I know whether a brother is loose or promiscuous? How will I know? And I told him, I said, By their fruit, you shall know them. So I said, Look, let me give you the signs of a loose man, the signs of a promiscuous man, and some of the things they can do that can give you a danger signal that this guy you get as a be. I said, As a woman, a normal man that understands life and is matured and careful about being involved in anything that is contrary to God, you will realize that men don't hug a woman face to face. So when you are hugging a man or a woman, you don't come and say, hey, you know, be, you know. And you see a lot of guys that do that, they say, oh, be, it's a warning signal. And some of those people, when you are hugging a woman, he's like, hey, how are you? God bless you. It's side by side. You don't tap currents. Because that one, now you are tapping currents. Now, you don't see some people, when they hold you, it's a lie. It's a signal. Now, some people, when they shake you, hey, honey, they be watching the handle. It's not man to my mind. And they are, you know, just playing with your hand. And sometimes, see the hand like this. They are touching your hand like this. I don't even know what I'm talking about. Ah, you see? You see what I'm saying? You know. I'm telling you, you see. And then, there are some guy went, look, bye. You see, ah, ah, you baby. You know, this is one level. Be watching my hand though. You know, this is another level. <laughs> now you see, I have a problem with the 21st century woman. The 21st century woman has not placed a value on herself. The 21st century woman has sold herself so cheap because she thinks that without a man she's not complete and she has become desperate and foolish. Hello? Listen to me. The Bible says we are complete in Christ Jesus. Marriage does not complete you. Marriage is like an empty vacuum. Marriage is like a cup of water. The quality of the marriage is determined by the quality of the people in the marriage. If there are two angry people in the marriage, you have an angry marriage. Two happy people, you have a happy marriage. Two poor people, you have a poor marriage. Two rich people, you have a rich marriage. So marriage does not have a character. Marriage takes up the character of the people in the marriage. So if marriage is like a cup. If you fill it up with water, it becomes a cup of water. Fill it up with juice, it becomes a cup of juice. Fill it up with poison, it becomes a cup of poison. So, many people need to realize that because, you see, the Bible says, people say, hey, you know, now you are married, you are now complete. That's an heresy. The Bible says we are complete in him. Our completion is in Christ Jesus, not in the relationship. No man or woman can complete you if you are not complete in Christ. 
But you see a lot of women, they don't place value on themselves. And that's why any man, bless you. That's why a man can just come and talk rubbish by your side and whisper sweet nothing. A lady slapped a guy, a sister slapped a guy in Naivigi one day. Bwah! I, I said, how can a woman slap a man? So I said, what happened? My brother, what happened? And when I said, yeah, yeah, it's where pastor, it's where I said, ah, 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 ah. oh boy, I misbehave. <laughs> so I said, it's not where my sister was. They said, can you imagine the stupid question he's asking me? Can you imagine? What does he think he's asking me if I'm a virgin? What kind of question is that? I have to slap him to teach him some lessons. I say, well done, my sister. Keep slapping. <laughs> Keep slapping. Hello? Yesterday morning, I was speaking in a singles conference in Agbara, and a lady asked me a question. She said, sir, I have a lot of guys around me. From what you have said now, and what, what normally is how many of them will propose to me, some of them will call me in the night, some of them will send me some stupid texts, and anytime they call me in the night, I tell them, please don't call me again. You don't. So I give them rules, and now when they send me stupid texts, I call them and say, never in your life send me that kind of text. So I've been dealing with that, and now people are saying now that I'm too harsh. So I don't know what you expect. I say you are not too harsh. You are a valuable vessel. I say now. I say let me ask you a question. Who are the people saying you are too harsh? Male or female? You say women. I say you see. The men will never say you are too harsh. Why? Because when they, you begin to place value on yourself, the news around will be gay or cheap or gay or leo. They will know that you are not somebody they can mess up with. I say, but it's the women that will be saying you are too harsh because your life has become a standard that is making them feel guilty for their lack of standard. I say, well, continue, my sister, because any man that wants to marry you will not be sending you stupid texts and calling you on ungodly hour when there's nothing attached. Place a value on yourself. When you go to supermarket, you can't price the goods there because there is a sticker that priced it. So price yourself so that nobody can come and measure you and price you three for five naira. Hello, somebody. Praise the Lord. My time is up. My time is up. Do you have, um, well, let me do one more and close. Number nine or whatever. A prisoner is a danger zone. A prisoner is what? Who is a prisoner? A pr prisoner is a man or a woman that is locked up in their past. A prisoner is a man or a woman that is still in their yesterday. I've met with people that by virtue of what they have gone through in their past, they have released their future into the hand of the devil. Let me tell you something. That one man broke your heart does not mean all men are devils. That one woman messed you up does not mean all women are devils. There are people that by virtue of what they have gone through, they have come to a place where they have allowed their problem to change their theology. And they have come to a place where whenever they say, I don't believe in love. I don't believe in love. I met a woman one day and all through my life, I've never met a woman like that. She passed through our church briefly. And one day, we were in a meeting, like, um, I don't know how to call it. We used to do what we call like a Gilga gathering, where we just relate with people when the church was just growing up. And this lady made a statement that was very sorry. She said, no, he said, let me tell you something. I don't believe any man can be faithful to one woman. <laughs> so I was like, you mean that? I said, yeah, it's true. I said, yeah. I said, but we are Christians. I was born again. He said, yeah. All men are the same. A man is a man. Ah. So I was like, you know, it was very strange to me because I've never had that kind of concept in church before. That you, I said, so you, are you now telling me that when you marry, you don't believe that your husband will be faithful? You say, ah, he said, I've prepared my heart. Nothing, nothing. I, let him just do it outside. Let him not bring it home. The best is the day he brings them to my house, that's the day. But let him do whatever nonsense he wants to do outside. I said, ah. Now, when she began to speak, I saw that she was speaking from a virus in the system. There was a virus that has entered into the system that is causing that corruption. By the time I sat down with her, I now discovered that she was a prisoner of her past. She came from a family where the father married the mother in church and the father ended up being promiscuous, impregnating different people and sleeping around. And then she herself got engaged to a guy and two months before her wedding, she discovered that the chief bridesmaid was pregnant for the guy. So, having come through that kind of experience, her father, her fiance, she now discovered that as far as she's concerned, no man can be faithful. So, she allowed two men 
to become the philosophy that she will use to judge six billion men. Listen to me. Whenever you meet with people, find out whether they are free from their past. Because people that are not yet free from their past will bring you back into their past. There are a lot of people that are born again. But because of what they have gone through in the past, and you see, in church, we don't deal with psychosomatic issues. In church, everything is demon, 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 demon. Let me tell you something. Emotional problem cannot be cast out like a demon. In order for people to be free from emotional problem and emotional sickness, they have to go through a therapy. It's called psychotherapy counseling. And most of those things don't take place in church. There are many of you sitting down here right now, you have been raped when you were young. You have been molested, sexually abused. So if you are sitting down here, you have been involved in all kinds of abuse all through your life. And when you come to church, all they tell you is born again, cast out devil, deliverance. And many of you, you still have those issues haunting you. You still have those issues injuring you from being able to release yourself and to feel love. Why? Because all the odds and the pains of your yesterday keeps becoming real every time you want to enter into your future. So every time somebody begins to show you love and affection, you start doubting the love. You start doubting the affection. Why? Because that's how the one of yesterday came. So there are people that are in church, they are bound to their emotion. They are imprisoned to their past. They are imprisoned psychologically to all the things that they have gone through. People don't talk about rape in church. There are lesbians and homosexuals in church. They want to be free. But people don't talk about that in church. Why? Because it's a taboo for people to talk about that in church. And there are people that have been molested with all kinds of things. And when people like us begin to deal with some of those things, people think we are not spiritual because we are not quoting scripture. I remember when I began to deal with some of these aspects of rape and molestation and psychotherapy counseling and began to deal with some of my youth and teenagers in church, many people were like, ah, you the pastor, you shit. But what I discovered was very shocking. Many dimensions of deliverance. One of the days I was dealing with one of these young girls, a 16-year-old girl, and she has already committed four abortions at the age of 16. By the time she will be 20, she will be a PhD holder in abortion therapy. By the age of 16, when I probed deeper, I discovered that she was disvirgin by her brother. Her own brother, the same father, the same mother, was the one that disvirgin her. Hello? And that's how I started probing and I discovered how there is so much family molestation in the family. By the time we brought the mother into the equation, when I sat the mother down and said, Mommy, this is what is happening. Are you aware? The mother just started weeping. Praise the Lord. Praise God. So people of God, we need to be free. And people of God, as you live here today, let me round up with this because of time. I've just opened your eyes to know that there are individuals that qualify to be called danger zone. But guess what? As you begin to, as you've been listening to me, don't just channel your focus on other people as danger zones. Begin from yourself. And ask yourself the simple question, am I a danger zone? I wrote a book years ago and a lady sent me a letter and when a 32 year old girl or lady in Nigeria is thanking you that she's not married and she's not engaged you know it's a testimony she read the book and she sent me a letter and said pastor I read your book and I just want to thank you because you have helped me to discover myself and I'm so I'm 32 but I'm so grateful to God that I'm not engaged and I'm so grateful to God that I'm not married I've been worrying about marriage until now See, because through your book, I've been able to discover that I am not yet single. I am not yet whole. I have issues. And anybody that marries me will have suffered. I would have been a problem to that person. But now, I'm working on it myself. And I know that when the right man comes, I will be a blessing. So when we talk about dangers, there are many of you sitting down here right now, you are not marriage material. Any man that marries you will be in trouble. Any woman that comes in contact with you will be in trouble. Because many of you are so spiritual. You are emotional giants. You are, you are spiritual giants, but you are emotional dwarfs. And you see a lot of people, we, we, you see, one of the greatest mistakes you can make in your life is to marry people in church. What do I mean by that? Marry people based on their level of spirituality in church. That does not matter. Everybody that comes to church is an actor and an actress. We all come to church on Sunday with our costumes. So everybody you see in church on Sunday morning is an actor, is an actress, and they come with their costume. It's when you get outside church that you see the real person. 
that's when they will show their true color. So if you marry somebody based on the fact that they are very spiritual, they pray in church, or they sing praise worship, that might be your downfall. Why? Because after what you see in church, there is a real person inside that is the one that you'll be living with when you get into marriage. Every head bowed in Jesus' name. I want to pray for two set of people before we take our questions. And I want you to know that I believe in prayers. I've seen prayer transform lives. And yours cannot be an exception once you open your heart to God. If you're in this meeting today, you say, Pastor, I've heard you. I came in here because I heard about the meeting. I was invited. I wanted to learn. But, Pastor, I want to give my heart to Jesus. I've heard you speak, and I think I need to get close to God. I want God to come into my heart and take over my life. Pastor, please, can you pray with me? I want to have a closer relationship with Jesus. If you're in this auditorium, can you lift up your hands? If you're in that category, let me pray with you. You want to give your heart to Jesus? Thank you, my brother. Thank you. You want to have a closer relationship with Jesus? Lift up your hands wherever you are. Let me pray with you. I see hands going all over the auditorium. You want to come to Jesus? You are, you are tired of sin and unrighteousness. You say, I just need Jesus in my heart. I need God to help me. I want, I want to walk in wisdom. I want the plan of God for my life to prevail. Can you lift up your hands very high? Don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed. I want to pray with you. I want to pray with you. I can see almost 20 hands going up. Just lift it up all over the auditorium. Thank you. Thank you. Now, those of you lifting up your hands, can you please rise? Don't be ashamed. If you're ashamed, you can stay there. There's still vacancy in hellfire. But there's also vacancy in hell. So it's a choice. It's a choice. If you're ashamed of coming to Jesus, the devil is waiting for you. So you just choose one. It's just a simple choice. But if you know you are not ashamed of God, you see, if you are not ashamed of me before men, I will not be ashamed of you before my father in heaven. So can you please rise up on your feet? Now, I want you to take a step. I want you to bring whatever you came here with and come. I want to pray with you and I have a little gift for you. Can you come? Come. Come before the altar. Come. Come. Those of you upstairs, overflow, just come. Come. You want to give your heart to Jesus. You want to have a closer relationship with Jesus. You want to surrender to him. Come. 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 Let's come. Make way for them. Let them come. 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 Come and surrender to him. All to Jesus I surrender all to him I freely give I will ever love and trust him in his presence of daily live surrender all I surrender all all to thee my blessed Savior I surrender I surrender surrender all oh I surrender all all to be my blessed Savior I surrender Father in the name of Jesus I thank you for this once. I thank you because you said in your word that whosoever comes to you, you will know why it's cast out. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that upon the confession of their mouth, you cause them to be justified. Lord, I pray in the name that is above every other name that you cause the assignment of hell to fail over their life from today. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name, lift up your hands and repeat after me, Heavenly Father. I can't hear you, Heavenly Father. I come to you today. I thank you for your word. I thank you because you died and shed your blood so that I can be saved. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Make me whole. Deliver me by your power. Cleanse me by your blood. Devil, I reject you. I renounce you. Every covenant, every agreement I have with you knowingly or unknowingly I break them today 
As from today, I belong to Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for a newness of life. Fill me with your spirit and make me whole. In Jesus' name, amen. I congratulate you. Father, I pray for these ones that from today, doing your will will be their heart desire. Knowing you more will be their heart's cry. Let today be the beginning of the rest of their lives. Let their names be written in the last book of life and fill them up with your spirit. In Jesus' name, we pray. Now, look at me. Look at me. You're going to go there. They have, uh, I've got a little gift for you. Just shake my hands as you go. God bless you. Go. Let's clap for them as they go. Lord bless you. in this auditorium you call upon my life and I leave this once before you whatever has hindered their marital destiny let it break now in the name of Jesus Lord I remove every obstacle I remove every hindrance whatever veil has hindered them from being located I command the veil to be torn away in the name of Jesus Lord I pray for a baptism of divine sensitivity I pray Lord that you open their eyes and you will cause there to be divine connection wherever that man is wherever that woman is that you have ordained for their life let their path cross let situation and circumstances work together for their good and Lord I pray that between now and the end of this year you will begin to speed up their marital destiny that one year from now these ones will be singing a new song thank you heavenly father in Jesus name we pray God bless you God. talking about molestation sexually or when a girl has lost her virginity what do they do when they have lost their self-esteem well if you've lost your self-esteem i've got a book here called building a strong self-esteem it deals with issues like this you need to understand that whatever has happened has happened you cannot roll back time and most of the time when people are victims of rape or abuse they go through about seven different stages which is seven stages of psychological you know um process the first stage that they go through is normally known as denial. They just want to, they, they are denying that it happened. The second stage is what they call blame or self blame. They begin to blame themselves. And most of the time, people always blame themselves for what people do to them because they are going through a process. And most of the time, the church does not have a structure to deal with those kind of psychosomatic issues. So, for you, I will ask you to realize that number one, what has happened has happened and you can't change it. And to honestly pray to God for healing of your emotion and to really begin to spend time reading the word of God and listening to good music that will help to heal your soul. And then do everything you can to pray in the Holy Spirit. If you can, one hour every day. As you pray in the Holy Spirit, it cleanses your system and cleanses you of all these kind of things that bring healing. How do you live with a control panel? Make sure they don't control you before you marry them. If you marry them, you are in trouble. There's no way you can do it. You are just in trouble. So it's before you marry them that you deal with That's why I'm talking to singles now to look at these issues so that you won't go and marry somebody that will put your life in trouble. Please, as a young man aspiring to get married and you met a desired lady at, of quality and you called her on phone and she turned you down because she doesn't know you, but you know her well. How can this be best handled? Thanks. Well, relationship has to be built and developed. If you know somebody very well, why would you call her on phone? Do you understand? Telephone is not, an, is, is not a matured way of communicating with people to meet with them on the first time if you can meet with them, especially for issues like this. So if you know her very well, look for a way to meet with her physically, not by telephone. And if you are calling her on the phone, if you are matured enough, there's a way you talk to her so, and talk to her and try to use the phone conversation as a platform to establish a physical conversation, not that you are calling her and toasting her on the phone. Somebody that has never met you before. It doesn't work like that. What does it mean to be born again? Does being born again have to do with our addressing as children of God? Well, to be born again means to have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. To have surrendered your life to what he did on the cross. So that you will no more live your life for yourself, but you begin to live your life for him. Does Christianity affect your dressing? Yes, it does. Because when God created you, he's the one that also created dressing. Why? When man fell, before man fell, man was clothed in the glory of God. 
when man fell God introduced dressing by bringing what the coat of skin now when man fell you need to understand that there were two origins the first thing that happened was that man took the leaves that God created to cover his nakedness and when God came God saw that that was not good enough and he brought the skin of an animal to cover man so that the blood will cover man to represent the blood of Jesus because without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sin so why do you dress? you dress to cover your nakedness so dressing is for covering of nakedness so as a born again Christian your purpose of dressing should be number one to cover your nakedness enhancement is secondary nakedness is the first so once you are dressed to cover your nakedness you are covered now the level of riches you have and your level of exposure determines your level of covering somebody else can cover themselves with 20,000 naira suits and somebody else can cover themselves with 200,000 naira suits is what you can afford just make sure you are covered that's all please can you tell us the best way to tell a lady that you are not interested in the relationship again I don't want it to be heartbreaking I want to leave the girl because she can't, she can't manage her anger okay well one of the things you need to understand is that God brings you into a relationship with people sometimes to be a blessing to them and even if you're not going to be relating with people try and see how you can help them to overcome their weaknesses so that you can help them to be better for the next level of their life so if you're in a relationship with a lady and she has anger problem talk to her about the anger sit her down and let her know the danger of her anger and how it does not even help her because see it takes more muscles and more veins to frown than to smile and every time you are angry and frowning you are aging faster it actually reduces the quality of your life and stresses your veins so when you help her to understand the danger of what she's doing you can help her come out of it and help her to always think before she speaks do you understand when you help her to think before she speak and to always you know there are ways you manage anger in anger management we teach people i do it, I, I have a course i teach on anger management and you teach people how to manage their anger while the Holy Spirit is transforming them. So you need to help her. And if you discover that she, is help, she, she cannot be helped by you, or you have tried and nothing is working, sit her down and let her know that, look, I love you. I wish we can go on. Don't be, don't be a liar. You see, one thing I've come to realize about life is that truth will always win. The Bible says because we have shown the foolish things of dishonesty, we have obtained grace and mercy. When you are honest, grace will come, mercy will come. Sit down and say, look, I love you, I care about you, I wish we can spend the rest of our lives together, but it's apparent that we're not meant for each other. This, your anger issue, is becoming more than I can handle, and I want us to go our separate ways and just be friends. Talk to us straight. There's no way you can break a relationship with somebody without breaking their heart. It's not possible. Just do what you have to do and move on with life. Yeah. Except they don't love you. So what do you mean? You break out now. Let your heart break. <laughs> because if the person... Who told you to give your heart to someone? The Bible says you should give your heart to a man. Hello? If you are a good Christian, why should you give somebody your heart? When the Bible says, Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your... So if you love God with all your heart, which one are you giving to a man or a woman? Is your heart tumbler or is it egg that they are breaking? So I want your advice. I'm in love with a guy... And we base the relationship on keeping ourselves until marriage. He's a believer and so am I. But the person I'm staying with is against the relationship because he said that he has gone to pray about it, that the guy's mother is not a good person. Please, I need help. I'm confused. Well, um, you see, as Christians, we have to be careful of prayer contractors and prophet liars that are in the business of prophecy, making money and confusing people's destiny. If you are a Christian, you have prayed, you are sure this is the person you want to marry, and two of you are keeping yourself pure, why will you allow an external interference to be doing consultation on your behalf? And is it the man you want to marry or his mother? So as far as I'm concerned, I'm always very careful of all these. They went to pray somewhere and all those, those stuff. Excuse me. We, we just dealt with a case recently of a woman that packed out of the husband's house with two children, saying that the husband is not her husband that she married the wrong person because a prophet told her that she married the wrong person by the time we did the investigation it was a prophet that told her also that the man is her husband so there are people that live their life by prophecies like that so they are, they are like wind tossed to and fro all around so as far as I'm concerned stay connected to God be prayerful and don't allow people to confuse you a lady is above 30 and not yet married what will she do to be married at this age just be a Christian and be, be yourself don't carry marriage on your head. 
you know because see you you have to make sure that you just make yourself findable make yourself findable and make sure you are a marriage material the bible says he that finds a wife not he that finds a lady not he that finds a woman you see a lot of women don't know that a wife is not somebody that is married <laughs> they, they don't understand that concept you see the bible says he that finds a wife not he that finds a lady many people are ladies they are women but they are not wives so before you ever get married the man that will marry you must see a wife material in you before marriage so your concentration now should be to be a material that is wife material and to be findable so that you can be easily located and God will perfect all things so don't stress yourself don't be in any form of anxiety he's working something out for you if a man asks you out and you used to call and suddenly you stop calling what will you do well um, communication is the strength of relationship and once there is no communication it's a sign that the relationship is being weakened so and also a man is an hunter when he's looking for something he pursues it once he gets it he begins to relax so you have to find out whether it is the relaxation of the hunting grace or it is a reduction in the value of the relationship by breaking communication once you discover that the love is no more there and is beginning to escape you have to sit him down and define the relationship so that you will not waste your life waiting for somebody that is not worth it you see women i tell you i've said it before i've seen a lot of people especially african women we don't value ourselves because we're in a culture that makes us look inferior to ourselves but let me tell you you are not inferior to any man you're not inferior to anybody and most of the time because of relationship and our desire to get married we we submit ourselves to relationships that are not good enough for us and sometimes you are holding on to a man that is not worth you that you stay two, three years. And you need to know that women grow old. Men don't grow old. And the man can still be 45 and get married to an 18-year-old or 25-year-old girl. But you, once you're out of the market, nothing, nothing. So you have to maximize your season and make sure you don't play games in the season of your life. So if your man is not calling you, sit him down and find out what's happening. You've not been calling me. Find out whether he's just busy or he's a face. And if it's something that is showing that he doesn't respect and value the relationship, move on to the next website. A man, is, a man in CNS and a Pentecostal sister, can they marry? As far as I'm concerned, whether it's CNS or Pentecostal or Catholic, is none of my business. Are you born again? There are Pentecostal people that are devils. Do you understand? So I don't do denominations. Because when we get to heaven, there is no Celeste, there is no Pentecostal, there is no Baptist. Are you born again? Do you have a relationship with Jesus? The Pentecostal charismatic word of faith movement is supposed to be a movement where people that are there are born again. But you and I know the greatest devils you can meet are in church. So just be sure the person is born again and living for Jesus. And if they are truly born again, it will decide the kind of church that they go to. So first start from the born again first before we go to the church level. Why cutting? Is it right to live with your partner while cutting or stay overnight? Don't do what married people do until you are married don't do what married people do until you are married. By the time you become a weekender, going to spend weekend or overnight, night VG, doing night VG, you are wasting your time. You see, I don't understand how you women think. It's, it's so amazing. You are a woman. The early stage of your life, you allow a man to molest you, kiss you, press your breasts, have sex with you, useless you, and you have forgotten that everything about you will be fading with use. And the man, no matter how old he is, is still a man. Now, you now discover that by the time you useless yourself with all these area boys calling themselves men around you, when you are now ready for marriage, you are not valuable enough for the person you want to marry. I've seen things, so I mean, I've been in this relationship for about 13, 14 years now, and I've seen things. I've seen married people break out of marriage just one month after marriage. I'm telling you, because many women useless themselves and they don't know that even after marriage it can tell on them. So please, please, a, a guy we dealt with the case, was it late last year? This guy got, the, got um, they brought did marriage with this new girl and when they brought the lady the first night they spent together the guy was tired. And he came and said, Pastor, I'm, I, I'm tired. He said, when I say what I, you see, all this, when I got there, ha, when I got there, ha! Say, Pastor, ha! 
Say it's just boy like that. Nothing. Say nothing. Say everything. Say fat. I was struggling to ah. And now that woman now thinks she's married, but the relation is over. They, they have sent the girl back to the village. So don't useless yourself for my sister. Going to sleep overnight, you are reducing your value. I don't you have parents? That you go and sleep in a man's house overnight, or your parents too are useless parents that will send you to the slaughterhouse. Is it possible for kissing to be avoided in a relationship? It's possible for kissing to be avoided if you are wise. Foolish people waste away their destiny because they don't know the importance of what they are doing. If somebody has told Abraham that sleeping with Agar will cause a generational problem that will exist in 2009, he will probably have changed his mind. Today now, Afghanistan war, Iraq war, they are all brothers and sisters. Is it not Ishmael and Isaac? So, listen to me. How many of you have answered here? You have an answer. Let me see your hand. When you bought the answer, it was in a park, right? You had the answer, you have the battery, you have the charger, you have the manual. Now, you see, that pack was what they sold to you. Now, lovemaking is a package. Inside lovemaking, there's kissing, there's romancing, and there's sex and all other things. Now, when you kiss, you're already making love. So, sex and lovemaking are two different things. So, people think that because they have not had sex, they are not making, you're already making love when you kiss. And as, an, as somebody that is not yet married, you will break scriptures because you, when you lost after somebody in your heart, you have already committed the act already. So, don't start kissing because you are a human being. Don't switch it on when you don't want the light or the current to flow. Because once you kiss, before you know it, you will do other things. Is it right for a girl of 17 to start having an affair and in the case the girl have a lot of guys disturbing her? And sir, how will she know the right man? Well, at 17, you are still a child. You see, the teenage stage of life let me help you see the teenage stage of life is a stage of confusion a lot of teenagers think that they are adult because they have adult facial because they are big they have breasts like their mother so they think they are big they are doing messes like their mother they think they are big and even though they think they are big because they have the physical features of a woman emotionally and psychologically they are still babies they are just about to come out of the formative stage of their psychological development and their emotional imbalance. Um, but they, do, they are not aware of that until they carry an adult responsibility. So they want to enjoy adult pleasure but not carry adult responsibility. So if you are 17, you are a fool to be thinking of boyfriend and girlfriend. You are visionless and purposeless to be thinking of men. Because at that stage of your life, you should be thinking of having a degree, having a career that will help you to become a valuable vessel. Your value will determine what you attract. If you start at 17 having boyfriend, you will most likely end up becoming an area girl and marrying one mechanic. And it can determine the course of your life. But if at 17 you pursue your vision, get a good degree, get a good job, your prospects will increase and you attract a better valuable person. So, if you think I'm joking, mess around. Life will teach you a lesson. Please, sir, you said one of the ways you know a loose man is hugging a woman face to face. Sir, what of if one is brought up in an environment that sees nothing bad in it and has no immoral intention for such hug? I mean, you don't have any intention but just to greet. Eh, no problem. You yourself will know whether you have a problem or not. So, no stress. There is no stress now. No, people hug like that without any intention. Yes, I know. No problem. So, if you know you are okay, no problem. I swear. What do you have to say about divine will of God in marriage and at what age is a man qualified to get married? Now, there is no age for marriage. You get married when you are ready. You get married when you are matured. So, the age of marriage is maturity. And maturity does not come with age. It comes with the ability to handle responsibility. You can be 42 and immature. You can be 25 and matured. And how do you rate maturity? There are seven ingredients of maturity. You see it in the book, Singles Get Ready seven ingredients of maturity that's what determines whether you are matured so they are spiritual, emotional, physical, financial moral, um, mental and social, seven ingredients of maturity once you are matured in those seven areas then you are ready for marriage now what do you talk about the will of God in marriage you see, I don't know the bible you read but the bible I read is from heaven and um, in my own bible I discovered that God does not choose wife for anybody he did it once and, and resigned from that ministry hello as a matter of fact, even the first one, he didn't really do it. 
he has never really chosen wife or anybody. Hello? For instance, when Adam and Eve, the first marriage was instituted, God said it's not good for a man to be alone. I will make him an helper, right? Now, what was the first thing God did after that statement? He brought animals. Hello? He brought animals. And the Bible says, of none of them was an elf found suitable. So that means the animals were an option. They were an option. So, he now went and brought a woman. And when he was bringing the woman, he didn't say, Adam, this is your wife. As he was bringing her, Adam said, eh, hey, this is bone of my bone. Of my flesh. She shall be called woman. He said, okay, you like it? Carry go. If Adam has said, I don't like this one, God will have created another one. So, the Bible says, he that finds a wife, it's not God that gives wife to people. You will find the wife by yourself. The only thing that God will do is that he will guide you to make the right choice. For many years, I've always asked the question, if God is the one choosing wife for people, how come all the pastors have beautiful wives? Why is it that pastors don't marry disabled people? Why is it that pastors don't marry ugly people? Because every time they tell you, let's close your eyes and pray, you are closing your eyes, but they are browsing to look for the best one. At 35, I'm still a spinster, but now I'm in a relationship with a widow of 43 years with one issue. The more I try to make the relationship work despite the love I showed to his daughter, still it proves difficult to understand. He later told me that a man do attack him in the dream to leave me. So what do I do? Well, if somebody is attacking him in the dream to leave you, that's spiritual marriage. So you need deliverance. You need to pray so that God will deliver you from spirit husband that is attacking the person that wants to marry you. And apart from that, the fact that you are 35 does not mean you should settle for less. If somebody is a widow or widower, he's supposed to be a widower. That's the debate, right? Be widower with a child and you are finding difficult with the child you have not yet married. The man himself is proving difficult. That's a warning signal. Don't sell yourself cheap. He's, let me tell you, let me give you a revelation. Catch it now. Lift up your hands and say, I catch it. Now listen to this. It is better to be single, open to be married, than to be married and praying to be single again. So it's better to be 40 years old, no husband, no nothing, and just be at, enjoying your life, than to be 32 in a man's house and you are like 50 because of frustration. I'm telling you, I've seen things, so there are many people in marriage, they wish they are single. They are, they are envying you. So don't rush, oh. don't go and carry one widow that will frustrate your life. If the guy does not appreciate you, doesn't value you before marriage, after marriage, your value will reduce. So how do we reconcile the issue of difference in genotype with divine direction? I don't care what voice you had. If your genotype is different, don't marry. If God is leading the two of you together, let that God change the genotype before marriage. If the genotype is not changed, don't marry. I don't care. Even if God appear to you with robes, don't marry. <laughs> Pastor, I'm a single lady. I'm not engaged to anyone. I have fear that it is I, highly spiritual. Do I need deliverance? The reason I ask is sometimes I see myself engaged in sex in the dream. Is this blamable? I have a serious fear considering my age. Okay, you are 35. If you have sex in the dream, it's a sign of spiritual pollution and it's a sign of spiritual marriage. So you need deliverance. If you have a church, talk to your pastor. Let them conduct deliverance for you. They don't believe in, your, in deliverance in your church. Deliver yourself. It's called spiritual marriage. So deliver yourself from anything. You have a covenant right to separate yourself from everything that is contrary to the covenant. So list out all the characteristics that you have seen that you don't like. Look for scriptures that tie into it. Spend a day, two or three days in fasting and praying and begin to deal with those issues. People say a broken relationship is better than a broken marriage. And so flee a relationship at the first sign of trouble. Thereby having had five or five years relationship. Now, now listen to me. How far do we walk things out before we run? Are you allowed to do try and error in relationship? There's no try and error in relationship, but a broken relationship is not divorce, but that does not mean you should be running from every relationship. Because even after you marry, there will be issues. So if you run from every relationship, when you marry, will you run? So you have to be matured enough. One of the, one of the signs of maturity is the ability to manage crisis and to be able to walk through crisis. That is called mental and social maturity. It's part of maturity that you need. Because when you marry, there will be issues. There will be conflicts. No matter what. Because marriage is not made in heaven. Contrary to many people's opinion, marriage is made here on earth. And if you think marriage is made in heaven, thunder and lightning also comes from heaven.
Hello. So, as an individual, you must make sure you walk through issues. And when you are looking at issues, read them under three umbrella. Things you can change. Number two, things you cannot change. Number three, things you can live with. Number four, things you cannot live with. There are some things you may not be able to change it, but you can live with it. You are married to a man or in fact, some things is after marriage you will realize them. How do you know whether a man snores or not? Until it's when you marry, the man begins to snore, the woman begins to snore. Will you divorce her because she's snoring? After a while, the snoring will become music to your ears. <laughs> so, when you are relating with people, find out all these issues. Are they things that are major issues? If it's just a little problem that can be dealt with or man, just move on with life because there's actually no perfect person anywhere. You are not perfect, so you can't see perfect people. There are no perfect relations. They are only relationship moving on to perfection. So, please, my question is that there is a guy that has been disturbing me for a long time to go into a relationship with him. But I don't even have any iota of love for him. So, please, what can I do in this type of situation? Don't marry him now. You don't love him. Why are you wasting your time? Don't you value your life? You don't love him. He's wasting your time. Tell him, I'm sorry. I appreciate your proposal. Don't insult him. Don't tell him off. Appreciate him and tell him it's not possible so that he won't waste your time and his time. So the person I love is an evil boy, but my parents rejected because I'm from Oshu State. What can I do? At, 20, at 22? At 22, you are loving an evil boy. You see, I'm telling you, it just shows that many young people of this, you guys don't have vision at all. At 22, do you have a certificate? Can you boast of 100,000? You are, in, you are love, in love with an Igbo boy. It's not the Igbo. Whether it's Igbo or Yoruba, at 22, you are too young to be thinking that way. Get a degree. And I don't know. I don't know you. I don't know about you, but do you want to suffer? Are you not tired of poverty? Is your parents' life not enough for you to motivate yourself not to fail? At 22, are you not? Don't you have brain? Eh? So tribalism is not the issue. Where it comes from is not the issue. The first 25 years of your life is called the learning stage of life. By 25, you shouldn't be in school looking for admission or trying to graduate. You should, be, you should have finished education. Do you understand that? But if under 25, you have yet to finish school, you are still talking relation. I don't know your problem. Oh. <laughs> because, oh, don't do work for me. <laughs> Sorry for you. Where is the next one? So what will you advise or say on age difference? Well, whosoever you want to marry, be sure it's the will of God. Mostly men are always older than their wife. But if you find yourself getting married to a woman that is older than you or a man that is younger than you, it's not a problem as long as you are sure God is in it. You pull love yourself and you can undo the age difference. You don't have problem with insecurity or you don't have problem with ego. If you know you don't have any of such problem, it doesn't really matter. Age is actually in the mind. So... It doesn't matter, but if the age difference is too much, it can cause trouble. Can you be in a courtship on the phone? I mean, distant relationship that include singing, okay, okay, seeing maybe once in six months, every communication is on the phone. Well, personally, Olumide Emmanuel, I don't believe in this kind of relationship. It's a personal opinion, so you, you are permitted not to accept the counsel. But let me tell you something. Over the years, that's why they talk about wealth of experience. Over the years, I've come to realize that all these, my fiancés in Ireland, my fiancés in Jamaica, my fiancés in America, it is the women that suffer. You end up tying down your destiny to something that is not waiting for you. And at the end of the day, they will leave you hanging and drop you from the scale of Everest. So, as far as I'm concerned, don't, don't reject what you can see that is certain just because you are waiting for what you are not sure of. So, let the Lord lead you, but I, I will really advise you to be careful about that. Final one. Just two more, okay. Um, I'm about to end the relationship because it checks my messages and questions them. When I was in financial distress, my HOD helped me, but he was angry, claiming my HOD must have intentions. He had made various advances at me. There are various examples. These are only few. And I'm breaking... Am I making the right decision? He is a fellowship pastor and always proves to be right. He is never wrong. My negative my negative is that 
I get very angry. Well, uh, my sister, you see, forget that pastor side. That fellowship pastor is keep that one by one side. Do you understand? All these funny, funny things they do on campus now. Small, small boys calling themselves Papa. People that have not even graduated. That is about to have extra year and carry over. All this fellowship thing you people do. You know, because I see your young boys messing and Papa, Papa. And that's how you think you are something. And you begin to fool yourself inside one local campus. <laughs> I sorry for you. So forget that even if it's a pastor of a geo of a church. You don't, you see, you don't marry tight. The man can be a general overseer and be an emotional dwarf and a frustration to your life. Ask pastor's wife, they will tell you. Hello, so forget about say be fellowship pastor. No, if he thinks he's always right, he's a wrong person because even me, I don't think I'm always right. I stand to be corrected. Do you understand? So, you need to know that warning signals are signs that the future is not right. And if you are warning signals and you're not comfortable, break off and move on. But if you feel that it is your anger that is leading him to do what he's doing, work on yourself and let God help you. Thanks for the inspired message, please. How can I deal totally with the spirit of lust? Well, um, it's a very, very good issue. You can get my book, Singles Get Ready. I dealt there with emotional maturity where I spoke about how to manage your passion. So you can get that book. It will really, really help you. But let me help you. I got born again as a teenager and um, I became a pastor at the age of 21. Um, became a general at the age of 25 and I've been in ministry now for about 20 years. Now, all through my life, God has helped me so I can tell you because it's what I have I can give you. Before I got married to my wife, I, I was pure for the 9 to 10 years before I got married. And since I got married to my wife, I have never met with any woman. So in the last 20, about 20 years of my life, I've never seen any woman's nakedness except my wife. I've never kissed any woman. I don't have a problem with all those kind of things. And why? Because when I was a teenager, even as a teenage boy, there was a stage of my life when I had 13 girlfriends. I was a very... Ter- my major problem was women. So when I got born again, it was the first thing I wanted to find out. What is the way out? Because I never believed that I could do without women. I thought that when I got born again, I would still be sleeping around. Because even when I was an unbeliever, I had many girlfriends in the campus fellowship. So when I got born again, it's the first thing that I had to connect with God to deal with. And God gave me deliverance through his word and through wisdom. So one of the things you need to understand is the first key is there's nothing special. Sincerely. Sex is sex. There's nothing special. There is no woman that is special than any woman. There's nothing special. Maximum, okay, good, 30 minutes. Is that what you want to use less your life for? Nothing special. There's nothing. It's just because we magnify it and make it look well. There's nothing special. Number two, count the cost. You see, if you plan to rise, don't mess up on your journey. Because, you see, by the grace of God, we have seen some level of influence and, you know, lifting. And I've come to realize that nobody investigates a failure. But once you begin to make it, they want to find out which primary school you went to, which secondary school is your father, who are your girlfriend. They want to search your history. So if you know you are planning to go somewhere, don't do anything today that will jeopardize your future. So that when you are now about to rise, they won't bring out one story about 20 years ago that will spoil your destiny. Do you understand? So count the cost. Put it on a scale. On this side, put the sex. On this side, put what you will lose. By the time you weigh it, it's not worth it. And then make a covenant with God. Job said, I've made a covenant with my eyes not to lust after a woman. So you have to make a covenant and bind yourself by a covenant and then be wise to avoid situation and circumstances that can set you up. Do you understand that? These are all issues you need to do. But get that book. It will help you. Praise God. Let's rise up on our feet. Were you blessed? So I'm going to be at the book stand for just a few minutes.